Hello, Citizens Counselor John Carlo Carra here, Ward 9 TV. This is uh, point two of the operationalization of the Great Neighborhoods, point one. So point one of Great Neighborhoods is that if Great Neighborhoods make a sit great city, and they do, create uh, tools and make that the focus of how you plan and develop your city. We just talked about heritage as being the fundamental first starting point of building great neighborhoods, respecting what you have. Point two is how do you enable that and how do you create a system for planning across the city? Uh, when I was sent to City Hall by the community of Inglewood specifically, uh, it was to enact the, uh, the, the, the mission of the Inglewood Design Initiative. And what Inglewood said is, if we want to continue growing the neighborhood that we are and become the neighborhood we want to be, we need a brand new comprehensive approach to local area planning that creates win-win-wins for the city, for the development industry and for the community and that identifies that through a next generation of local area planning. And when I went to City Hall and said, look, we need to do local area planning and we started doing that local area planning along the, uh, you know, the test case communities along the Green Line, the plan was to uh, take that across the whole city. And at first I got a lot of pushback. They said, well, you know, every time you write a plan, it's a big thick document and 10 years from now, some of our planning thinking changes and if we have 150 plans on the shelf, you're never gonna be able to change all of those plans. And that's in fact what we have. We have all kinds, we have bookshelves worth of stale dated plans. And so the way to get around that is twofold. Number one, when you plan, plan for the future. Plan for what the neighborhood's gonna be when it grows up. Don't plan for the next 10 years or the next 20 years. Don't restrict what's trying to happen. Talk about what you wanna become in the fullness of time and get there. And then number two, put all of the operational, I mean, put all of the policy in a guidebook, and then when you write your local area plan, uh, it references that guidebook. And so through that idea, the, something called the Developed Area Guidebook was born. And the Developed Area Guidebook is really point two of the Great Neighborhood's mission, and it's called Developed Area guidebook and we sometimes call it the D-A-G, the DAG, which I understand in Australian is a bad word, but as we're not Australians, we're going to go with it. The other idea is that developed area guidebook, it's because it's in the developed areas that we're getting the most of our redevelopment action. But the idea is that in the not too distant future, we're gonna take the developed area guidebook, we're gonna take the center city guidebook, and we're gonna take the new communities guidebook, and we're gonna turn it into one guidebook to rule them all that puts all the best policy in one place. Because let's face it, whether you're talking about the inner city, whether you're talking about the developed areas of the city, or whether you're talking about new growth on the edge, the principles of building great neighborhoods are the same. And that's something that we've really come to understand. So what the Developed Area Guidebook does is really four things. It's the source book, and the first thing it does is it enables a next generation of broadly uh, applied local area plans, also known as LAPs, LAPs, local area plans. So the idea is that we want to actually, across the entire city, create a next generation of local area plans. And in the one Calgary business plan, uh, service plan and budget, uh, we enabled the planning part department to do just that. And I'm gonna talk about the scale at which these plans take place a little bit later uh, when we talk about the community representation framework. But the first thing you have to understand is that the role of the developed area guidebook is to be the source document that's flexible and living that empowers uh, the local area plans to take that source material and apply it to the unique conditions on the ground of every part of the entire city, starting in the developed areas and specifically uh, starting in the Green Line communities of uh, Inglewood, Ramsey, uh, Highfield, and uh, Milligan Ogden and South Hill, which is, which is where we're learning how to build the developed area guidebook and build the next generation of local area plans. 
The next thing that the local air, uh, that the developed area guidebook does, and when we decided, when we came to the realization that we had to plan everywhere in the city, we couldn't just, you know, let old plans lie that weren't in line with the realities of the future, and that we had to actually create the opportunity to get there. What we, what we also said is that the developed area guidebook is not only working its way down to the local area plans, but it's also working its way up. 2019 marks the 10-year anniversary of the Municipal Development Plan and the Calgary Transportation Plan. In 2009, uh, the City of Calgary, after exhaustive um, public engagements through something called the Imagine Calgary Pro Process, uh, brought into law a new municipal development plan for the city of Calgary that for the first time ever contemplated Calgary uh, balancing growing outwards with growing upwards. And uh, it was in many ways a very powerful and amazing and important document. In other ways it was um, a lot of words that weren't as well formed as they needed to be. And in developing the developed area guidebook Council was very clear that we said, you're not just going to build local area plans from this thing, but you're also going to build the next redux, the refresh of the municipal development plan, the MDP, and the CTP, which is the Calgary Transportation Plan. And, you know, interestingly enough, in 2009, uh, there was still enough of a disconnect between how we move around the city and what's happening on the ground in the city that these things were separate documents. In the Redux, which is going to be informed by the Developed Area Guidebook, uh, these are going to become one plan, the Calgary Plan. The third thing is uh, these really deal with policy. And if you've seen my Heritage doc document, you realize that there's policy, which talks about the things we'd like. But then there's also something else, and it's called the Land Use Bylaw. And the Land Use Bylaw basically says what you're allowed to do. And unfortunately, we've inherited a planning system where our aspirational policy and the nuts and bolts law that enables what happens on the ground are totally different things that don't often talk to each other. They often don't even line up. We'll say, we'd like this neighborhood to become this, but what you're allowed to do on the ground is something else entirely. And if you want to do what we're asking you to do, then you have to come and pay the city a tremendous amount of money to change it and face a lot of, uh, of conflict. So our next generation of local area plans are not just going to be about policy, they're also going to be about a new land use bylaw that is next generation and is deeply integrated into that. And so the role of the DAG is to really become the chassis of the next generation uh, land use bylaw also known as an L-U, sorry, L-U-B. I'm going to erase that. L-U-B for the land waste bylaw. The final thing that's going to happen as we plan communities across the city, as we rewrite our MDP, as we integrate the next generation land use bylaw, so these two things are deeply integrated, is that we're going to have an emerging picture of what are our infrastructure requirements. One of the big challenges that confronts the inner city, as opposed to the new environment, the greenfield environments on the edge of the city, is that we've got pipes under the ground that were sized for certain uses that are old school technology. Some of them were put in by wheelbarrows. I think I made the mistake of saying there were wooden pipes in the ground on 17th Avenue Southeast. There were or Southwest, there were, they just weren't in use. The point is there's a lot of ancient infrastructure and we've got limited infrastructure dollars to spend. And what we used to do is we used to basically um, spend infrastructure dollars where things were happening. And there were a lot of places where things weren't happening because there weren't the infra infrastructure dollars spent. And if you look at the East Village, it's a classic example of a place that would never have developed unless we put the infrastructure in first. And now that we have, look what's happening. And the big thing is, you know, it's nice to develop the East Village. It's nice to develop on the edge of the city. But unless you understand what's happening across the entire city, you can't make an apples to apples comparison about where you invest your infrastructure dollars. And that's really number four that the DAG enables is it creates a forward looking plan that talks about what every patch of ground in the city is going to be when it grows up. And it allows city council and local activists 
and uh, communities and, uh, and the development industry to, set, to make the case for why investing infrastructure dollars there as opposed to anywhere else makes sense. So we have an apple to apple infrastructure investment system. And it's those four things under this developed area guidebook that sit at the core of great neighborhoods point number one, which is that if great neighborhoods make a great city, let's plan for great neighborhoods rather than just expect them to happen or hope that they happen. Apples to apples infrastructure investments takes us to the third thing I'm going to discuss in the next vi video, which is uh, Main Streets. So come along with me on that one. Giancarlo Carra and the Developed Area Guidebook signing off.